The art of Chinese painting is one of the oldest continuous artistic traditions in history. Its unique evolution is unparalleled in the art world. From highly colorful religious artworks to distinctive monochrome landscapes, the painters of China have strived for centuries to represent and reflect on the environment around them in this vast country. And in doing so, have created an aesthetic which is truly unique to these lands. Being installed here at the Victoria and Albert Museum are a selection of Chinese paintings so rarefied that none of them were ever intended to be hung in a gallery or museum. Masterpieces of Chinese painting span some 1,200 years and includes over 70 rare works of art. This exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum is a comprehensive display of an artistic tradition that was so innovative it was centuries ahead of European art history. This collection of masterpieces are some of the best known examples of one of the world's greatest artistic traditions, the art of Chinese painting. I'll travel to China to learn who the earliest painters were, why the written word had a huge influence on painting style, and how an artist emperor helped to bring about the country's golden age of painting. I'm in the Gobi Desert, some 1,500 miles west of Beijing, to see a highly prized collection of early Chinese painting, which was hidden from the world for centuries. These are the Magao Caves, the oldest and largest collection of Buddhist art anywhere in the world. Inside this vast complex of grottos lie 45,000 square meters of painted murals and thousands of sculptures. Between them, they span more than a millennium of cultural history. Situated at a crucial crossroads on the ancient Silk Road, this area was once the gateway to the Chinese Empire from Central Asia. The earliest caves here date back as far as the 4th century AD. The outside influences of passing traders on the Silk Route are clear from the stunning artwork on the walls of these caves. It's just the most extraordinary thing, walking in from the Gobi Desert to find a cave this vast. The seated Buddha is over 20 meters tall, and surrounding him are just this extraordinary myriad of murals in all different colors, still really vibrant, even though they've been here in the desert for hundreds of years. And the secret to that vibrancy is the earliest use of ultramarine, a pigment sourced from lapis lazuli, a substance which would have traveled along the Silk Road from Afghanistan and which wasn't seen in European painting until the Middle Ages. Professor Pung has been resident archaeologist here for 25 years. Tung the entire complex of caves was abandoned in the 14th century and not rediscovered for more than 500 years. This and the unique desert conditions here helped to preserve the site in its current state. But it's the survival of another collection here, against all the odds, which has proved to be the most important discovery of all. This tiny chamber is known as the Library Cave. There's not very much to see today, but when it was discovered in 1900 by the Taoist abbot Wang Yuanlu, it was crammed floor to ceiling with tens of thousands of important manuscripts and an incomparable hoard of priceless works of art. 
Concealed behind a wall in this cave was a treasure trove of artworks. The collection is thought to have been concealed in the 11th century, meaning it was hidden from sight for almost a millennium. Wang Yuanlu Dao Shi, Ouran Fa Yin Tang Ying Dong. This is China's four treasure trove of artworks. It's a Chinese museum. 是百科全书式的一个大发现，在世界上，在中国都是独一无二的。The discovery of thousands of manuscripts and artworks dating back as far as the fifth century was big news in the art world, and even at the turn of the twentieth century, good news travelled rather quickly along the Silk Road. Before long, Western explorers arrived on the scene. First in line in 1907 was one Oral Stein, a British-Hungarian explorer, whose expedition was part-funded by the British Museum. Stein saw at once the value of what the abbot had discovered, and set about trying to acquire the collection. He ultimately walked away with a huge haul, which included hundreds of documents and manuscripts, not least the Diamond Sutra, now known as the world's oldest printed book. Although it may seem astonishing to us today, Stein convinced the abbot to part with a huge number of priceless artworks, including a beautiful collection of painted silk banners. They were perfectly preserved in these dry conditions, making them the earliest examples of their kind anywhere in the world. Had they not been hidden, these rare silk banners would almost certainly have been destroyed. Such pieces were made for worship and regularly disposed of. The original banners have been in the possession of major European museums ever since their discovery in 1900. The V&A exhibition will provide an exceptional opportunity to see this astonishing collection together, with 12 of them on display in one room. The ceiling of the library cave preserved countless treasures for future generations. These unique banners are over a thousand years old. That they survived at all is remarkable. That they exist in such astonishing condition is truly a wonder of history. We know very little about the mysterious artists who painted these stunning works of art, as early works such as these were never signed. Up until around the time that the library cave was sealed at Magal, at the turn of the 11th century, painting was considered just another lowly artisan trade, comparable to pottery or carpentry. But within two centuries, painters would have earned themselves a position amongst the very elite of society. They would shun colour, and what's more, they'd be working in a very different style. Misty, monochrome depictions of mountainous landscapes are perhaps the most familiar form of Chinese painting in the West. So what changed? How did we get from this to this? Why was paint superseded by ink? How did colourful Buddhas give way to mountains and streams, and lowly artisan painters go up in the world to become highly educated scholars? For centuries now, monochrome depictions of landscape and nature have become considered the apotheosis of Chinese classical painting. But the style, so unique to this region, faced a long road in becoming accepted as a high art form, and the reasons for that are due to those age-old standards of class and politics. From the earliest times, it was an established practice for the imperial court to recruit the most talented artisan painters in society. To work in the palace workshops, the best court painters were often highly talented, but they were clearly seen as hired hands with low status. Court painters, we would have to say, they are artists who are drafted, possibly from、uh, provincial workshops, because they have excelled and they have been drafted into service at court. Essentially, a number of tasks. Would await them there. Sometimes this would be the making of objects that are clearly artworks, such as hanging scrolls or hand scrolls or fans or album leaves. 
Sometimes their function might be more in the line of interior decorations. Court paintings were colourful and tended to have a message. Very often the aim would be to improve moral standards at court. This painting, the Admonition Scroll, is amongst the most famous remaining examples of this early style and attacks the excessive behaviour of an empress. This graphic figurative style dominated court painting for centuries, but a shift was on the horizon that would change Chinese painting forever. And the man responsible was the artist behind this stunning work. This work was painted by one Emperor Huizong of the 12th century Song dynasty. He was both artist and ruler and used his power to change how art was perceived. Emperor Huizong was the um, very elegant um, scholar and also a very accomplished artist himself. At the same time, he was a great art historian. It is an almost unique moment that you have an artist who is an emperor or an emperor who is at the same time an artist. It's, it's very exceptional. Court ladies preparing newly woven silk is the most famous painting attributed to the hand of the talented emperor. This stunning hand scroll painted in the 12th century will be the star attraction of the V&A exhibition and is amongst the most important early masterpieces of Chinese painting in existence. The painting portrays the ladies of the court working silk and is in fact an earlier copy of an 8th century work. It follows the 8th century figure painting tradition with the heavy colouring, with the very, very bright colours, and also the brushwork itself is really elegant and fluent. The talented emperor left an astonishing artistic legacy far beyond the inheritance of his own masterpieces. In the year 1104, Emperor Huizong made a decision that would help to bring about the end of an era. He opened the National School of Painting and selected 30 students from across the country. Not only did they receive technical fine art training, but the academy also provided a well-rounded general education. The emperor's decision to educate his protégés all those years ago helped to change the course of Chinese art history. His impact is a massive. He's a brilliant uh, artist. He's a brilliant collector. Mm. And uh, really, through him, he raised the status of artist of painter from artisan, mere artisan, to artists. And he set up the first person who set up the school in the court, school of painting, which on the same level as the school, imperial school for poetry and for classics. And he really, the person who really regards the painting as a high art. Huizong's period, the Song Dynasty, also saw a shift in style and subject matter and has come down to us as the golden age of Chinese painting. We regard the Song paintings as a peak of the art of painting because the first is that realism, the second is that ideal beauty it conveys and the design as well as the uh, depiction of what the artists see is a dream for many later Chinese painters and to achieve this ideal beauty. Under Huizong's direction, the newly educated court painters of the day began to produce works depicting highly detailed scenes from nature. The emphasis was now firmly on realism. One quintessential work of the time, attributed to the emperor himself, is a work entitled Auspicious Cranes. It's supposed to be a record of a um, real happening of a 20 cranes suddenly descending to the sky above the Forbidden City. And uh, the record says uh, many people in the capital uh, saw that. They all saw this as a auspicious sign. So he really, he said, I will record this auspicious sight. The artist